Hey everyone, can you hear me? Thanks for sticking around, I'm sure you're all hungry. So my name's Keith Smiley and today I wanna to talk about the set of tools that we use to build our apps at Lyft. So we're a ride-sharing company primarily based in the US and kind of over the last few years, fueled by the growth of our iOS team, we kind of started hitting some limits in the standard tooling and that made us kind of looking to look for other solutions. So I wanna talk a little bit about first our the size of our code base and our team and everything. So first off, we have a really large team, uh, as you just heard. Um, we do have multiple apps, and there's like a ton of features that go under the radar, like kind of outside of the golden path. So there's a lot of people who are all very busy working on this, but with a lot of developers comes a ton of code. Um, there's two interesting things here. One is we have zero Objective-C, so we did a swift rewrite of our original code base a few years ago. Um, there are some talks online about that if you're interested. Uh, the other interesting thing is that about half of this like 800,000 lines of code was written in the last six months. So like the growth rate of people adding code is like very, very quick. Um, so as part of this, as we added a bunch of code, we decided to modularize. Uh, there was a talk about that earlier this morning and a lot of the reasons that were brought up there were kind of why we decided to do that as well. This kind of gives developers like isolated ownership of the features they're working on or like the shared components that can be used across many different features. Um, and with this comes a really large Xcode project. So we have like 1,200 targets if you generate an Xcode project with everything. So the difference here between the module count and the target count is that targets are also like unit tests and resource bundles and things like that. So this gets kind of unwieldy. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the last thing I want to mention is we also have a bunch of interface builder files. I only really mention this because I feel like a lot of big companies aren't really invested in interface builder, and we historically have been. So I would say probably like at least 90% of like view setup and configuration is all done in interface builder, which I really only bring up because if it weren't for this, we would have like a lot more code because so much stuff is done in interface builder. So this gives you a sense of our size now, but we kind of started hitting some of the problems I want to talk about a little bit earlier as well. Um, and I want to talk about some specifics. So, you know, first off, as many of you probably know, Xcode is like a very complicated tool. It supports a lot of things, a lot of different configurations and types of targets you can build, and generally like years worth of cruft that they have to continue supporting virtually forever because people do stuff and they don't want to break them, right? But I th think that we found this made like doing simple things that we wanted to do, especially to enable the modularization, particularly difficult. So I have some specifics. Um, first off, you know, when we started adding a bunch of new projects, we started just hitting problems where we found that like Xcode Proj, the file format of like your project is just not the right tool for the job. So, you know, of course, probably many of you have seen, regardless of the size of the team you work on, like conflicts that you don't know how to solve. But even ignoring that, I think that configuring your project in a file format that you can't write, read, understand, code review at all is like, kind of scary. Uh, Felix mentioned this in his talk yesterday as well. And I think that really when you start trying to like optimize your builds for your developer productivity, like as your code base grows, you kind of have to understand your build before you can actually optimize it. And you can't really understand it if it's in a format and like a black box that you can't understand. So there are of course some things you can do to like improve this. So one that we did many years ago is move to this tool called Xcode Gen that like generates your projects from some other handwritten spec. If you haven't done this, you should totally look at it and see if it's worth it for your team, solves a bunch of issues. But this didn't really solve the like, core problem we had, which is to modularize, we wanted all targets the developers created to be the same no matter what, and really what we wanted to do was like, kind of create an abstraction that made sense for our engineers. And a huge piece of this is like, some of the benefits we get from like, having zero Objective-C means that we can kind of simplify some things that won't work for everyone. So in a general tool like Xcogen, it may not make sense to support, but we want to make it easier for our developers. Another example of this that like, Christoph was talking about was if you want to generate code, like say strongly typed assets for uh, you know, accessing images in, in Swift, you know, we don't want to have to have developers add custom build scripts and like, duplicate the script calls and like, probably accidentally mess it up a few times. Really, we just want to make it trivial for developers to like, add a new module and start working on their actual features. Um, so even if you get past like, kind of this configuration thing, the next problem we hit is that because of all those targets I was talking about, using Xcode itself is really hard. Um, part of this is like that project that has 1,200 targets is like a 60 megabyte project file. And when you actually open it, Xcode just beach balls for 45 seconds before you can actually click a single thing in the UI. And then 
Once you're past that, if you get a list of targets at some point, you have this like 1,200 line list, and if you can't search it, you know, trying to like add a file to a specific target becomes a huge pain. Um, for a while with Xcodegen, we've actually provided a way for developers to like generate a smaller project that only includes the transitive dependencies of the things they're actually working on, but even with that, they still get like a really sluggish experience, which just kind of like slows down their productivity in general. So really what we wanted to do here was like detach what Xcode shows from what's actually being built under the hood. And if you think about this in terms of having like separate feature modules, I think it starts to make sense because developers really only need to work on their feature modules. They don't really need to know about all of the other features that go into building your final app with all these other building blocks. So the next problem we have is like, even if you get past the giant projects and the configuration bit, every time you pull, since there's 70 other engineers you know, working on the same repo, um, you kind of have to rebuild everything realistically because no matter what, multiple times a day, someone's gonna commit a change that's like low enough in the shared dependency tree that it's gonna invalidate everything and you just have to build everything. And for us, since we have so much code, this ends up being a huge hit on productivity, right? Developers switch branches, they end up having to wait, you know, like over 10 minutes to get like a clean build of the new app. So these are some of like the concrete problems we solve and you know, some of these we can improve with different tools that already exist, right? Like we talked about generating projects, and that helps, or maybe we could pre-compile some dependencies, which a lot of people do, and that might help with some things. But we also have some other problems we wanna solve, and we're kind of thinking the, about this in, the, in terms of, you know, we kinda of want a tool or a set of tools that like works really well as we continue to grow. Because like I said, we have a bunch of code, half of it was written in the last six months, so six months from now, we're gonna have a bunch more, and we wanna make sure that like developers stay productive in the long term. So, some of the other things we wanted to solve with this were having a little bit more control over the build. So like I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, having everything in your Xcode project doesn't really give you that. And in our case, we have two engineers, including myself, like working on productivity for the other 70 engineers, like from the tools side. And sometimes that means we want to change things in a way that makes sense for us, but not for Xcode. One of the other, one of the specific problems that was also mentioned this morning was like Xcode's support of Swift static libraries, which is pretty recent. And actually, to modularize, we kind of needed this because of the impact that dynamic loading has on your app. And so we actually ended up like hacking around in Xcode and replacing the linker with like a custom script that called it with the right arguments. And that stuff just doesn't really scale for us. And really what we want is a tool that we can like kind of hack on in a way that makes sense for us to like improve these kind of things for everyone. And since Xcode, you know, is just kind of this closed source black box, really the best you can do is like ask Apple for features and hope they come eventually. But obviously that's not really productive for us. So Another thing we wanted to solve was um, kind of the duplication throughout the company around these same problems. So I mentioned our iOS team is kind of large, but we also have an Android team that's like the same size. And we also have like a thousand other engineers in the company who kind of started to face similar problems in depending on the projects they were working on. So specifically, we have this uh, team working on building autonomous cars. And it turns out that like, building the firmware for autonomous cars is like kind of similar to shipping apps from like a build system perspective. You know, they have hundreds of people working on the shared code base. They end up having like one C++ binary that they like put in this car and run it. And so it turns out, you know, they were hitting a lot of the same problems as us. So from our perspective, it'd be really great if we had a set of tools that we could share between iOS and Android and this other team so that any productivity gains we get, we get like across the board. And obviously, we're not really expecting Xcode to ever help this use case of like building Android apps. So ideally, we'd move to something that would work for this as well. So I hope this gives you like a little bit of context on why we made this decision. Uh, I'm not gonna talk much more about it, but you know, we thought about this long and hard because obviously we're kind of like off the golden path of uh, developer experience with Apple stuff now. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about like how we can even do this and what does it even mean to replace this. So, Xcode has this underlying tool, Xcode build, uh, and it does like a few specific things. So from a very high level, it has like a few specific things it has to do. So first off, you know, it takes your source files, your images, you know, Swift, Objective-C, and your project definition, whatever that means, like probably your Xcode proj, and it knows how to like build them, right? It knows how to call the compilers and like pass the right arguments and all this good stuff. And to do this, it takes like a lot of iOS specific knowledge, right? Like what version you're deploying for and all this other stuff. Uh, and you know, it also has to know like how the underlying tools work, like how, what flags does Clang support and stuff like that. The next step uh, is kind of like packaging this all up. Uh, 
So Peter yesterday in his talk showed an example of like what a Mac OS like app looks like internally, right? You have the binary, you have some other stuff in different places. And the tool kind of needs to know how to do this too, so that when you go like, I need this asset that I bundled with my app, like it has to know how to find that at runtime. It has to be in the right place so that it can find it. Um, obviously these two things like encompass a huge amount of complexity in any tool that's gonna do this. Like, you know, you have to support all these different platforms, like watchOS and tvOS and all this stuff is kind of different. So there's a lot in those two pieces, but that's as, that's as granular as I'm gonna get with those today. Um, the next thing that you may not think about as much is, you know, it really has to like do as little as it can every time you hit build, right? Because no matter how big your project is, if every time you hit build, it ended up rebuilding everything, like that wouldn't work for you very quickly at all. So it has to have some like running understanding of, oh, you know, you changed this file, here's all the other things that need to change because of that. Uh, and related to that, you know, it needs to do all that like really fast because this is what's between you and like doing actual work. Like ideally, you know, you never had to think about any of this, everything when it's instantaneous, uh, and then, you know, you could just get on with like building impactful features, but unfortunately that's not the reality. So these are kind of like some of the very high level properties you need from a tool to replace the Xcode build here. And so we kind of like started looking around in the community, like, you know, we don't want to build something for this because any of these single pieces is such a huge task that like, you know, Lyft isn't in the business of like writing build tools. Uh, you know, I've obviously we're happy to like optimize some things, but we don't want to take on something that huge. So we kind of started looking around uh, for different tools in the community that could do this. And uh, unsurprisingly, there aren't many options. Um, we ended up switching to a tool called Bazel. Uh, and so Bazel is this open source build tool written by Google. Uh, they've been using some version of it, uh, like maybe a slightly different fork internally for a really long time, and they build like their entire multi-billion line monorepo with it. So uh, it can do, it can compile a lot of languages, like they use it for iOS, Android, backend, and everything. Uh, and it has some really interesting features that kind of like solve some of the problems that I was talking about. So first, it has this like really flexible build configuration language that actually allows you to define your own abstractions, and this kind of gets to that problem of like, we wanted to ever define everything the same way. So our abstraction for this, you know, looks something like this. Um, so from this, you get, you know, a new module called storage and it has some dependency on something and you get a new unit test and stuff. And I think this abstraction is like really nice for us, but really the powerful part here is that you can define this. Like internally, these are all like Python-ish functions and then Bazel kind of gives you the primitives for like, here's how you build a thing. And so you can do whatever makes sense for you. So again, like, like I said, we don't have any Objective-C, so a big thing here is, you know, we don't have to expose a way for developers to pass one of a million different Clang flags to do something crazy, and that means that they also know, whenever they look at this file, that like, the module that they're looking at is configured the same way about than, that every other module in the project is, and they don't really have to think about like, oh, how is this built, or like, is this built differently in a way that I have to care about when I'm writing code in this module. The other really nice thing here is that this is the entire config for this module. There's nothing else. There's nothing in like an Xcode proj. There's nothing in Xe config files or something. Like this is this is it. So I think it makes it really simple for developers to like read and write this, unlike if we had it in an Xcode project as well. So this is a really nice win for um, you know this kind of consistency across different modules. The next thing that kind of enabled for us was we could get this like. Um, detachment from Xcode and Bazel. So Bazel knows about everything that needs to be built because they're all defined in these like module files like the last thing we were looking at. But Xcode doesn't have to know about that. So the really powerful thing is we can actually generate an Xcode project with only the targets developers are interested in working on. So for the previous example, we can generate a project that just has two targets if you want, or three if you want to like test your module in a specific app. And that has like a huge impact on Xcode performance. So like, you know, the time it takes Xcode to even open the project. So on the left is like, oh, uh, I can see it in my notes, but I can't see it on the screen. Hmm. Uh, well, imagine this is a very impressive graph of time. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I can I can explain the graph. Uh, so mainly this took our like developer experience in Xcode um, and like the time it takes to open a project goes from like the 45 seconds I was talking about for these massive projects to like almost nothing. It's kind of like if you just did, you know, file new project in Xcode and like the performance you get from Xcode in that case is what you get with these smaller projects. And that's a really nice experience for developers. The other nice side benefit is that 
we can generate that project, like I said, with just what the developer actually needs to work on. So if they you know, work on five different feature modules, that's the only thing they end up seeing in Xcode. They don't see the other 800,000 lines or whatever of source that actually go into building the app. But when they hit Command B in Xcode, it all goes through Bazel, and everything gets built regardless. Uh, so that, that's been a really huge win for us. And um, that actually took a ton of work. Uh, so I, I Xcode doesn't really like you replacing the build system under it. Uh, so to get Xcode to like behave the same way as it does with just a normal Xcode project actually took us a ton of work. But uh, that ended up working out really well. And like developers barely have to know that under the hood, it's not actually being built with Xcode, which is really great. So the next really amazing feature that Bazel has uh, that's kind of like outside of the scope of what Xcode does is it provides you what they call hermetic builds. And so there's a, in the, during the testing talk yesterday, there was a little bit of conversation about pure functions. And you can kind of think about it like that. So this means that given the same inputs for, to Bazel, you'll always get the same outputs, which doesn't really sound particularly interesting. But this unlocks some really nice features. So one of those is you never have to do a clean in Xcode again. <laughs> yeah, so this is a, you know, a really nice win. I mean, the, the thing here is that uh, you should never be able to get into a state where cleaning is the solution, because in order to, for Bazel to ensure this hermeticity, it has to know about like, all possible inputs and outputs, whether that's your Xcode version or you know, whether or not you go and delete some file in the final built thing or whatever. You should never be able to get into a state where this is the solution, which is really great. And that's a really great feature. But there's some, some much flashier features that Bazel offers around this. So one of these is called remote build caching. And the gist here is that if I build something on my machine, given some set of inputs, I can push it to some web server. And then if you go to build on your machine with the exact same inputs, then you can just download mine instead and skip building it all together. And this is entirely based on that property, because X, or Bazel can guarantee that no matter what, if we have the exact same inputs, you'll get the exact same output. So it doesn't matter what computer you built this on. And I think you'll have to imagine another impressive graph now. Uh, so the, um, so the gist here is that using remote caching go, takes our build times of like a clean build of our Rider app from about 12 minutes to like two minutes, because developers instead just kind of download all of these binaries instead. And this kind of solves the problem we were talking about originally of, uh, you know, if they don't change it, why do they need to build it? Uh, so that's a huge win for working on a large code base where so much of the code is something that you're never going to change. So the next step is, you know, if you know that you can already guarantee that given the inputs and outputs you know, from a, person's, a different person's computer, like you'll get the same thing on yours, why even build it on your computer? So of course, probably most of us have like a laptop that's kind of fast, maybe a new 16-inch MacBook Pro or something, and that works OK. But as the code base continues to grow, like what if you could instead parallelize your build across hundreds of cores of other machines somewhere else so that you could you know, get to doing your work faster. And this is something that Bazel supports, which is really great. And uh, if you have a blank image and, and, a, uh, and a server rack full of Mac minis, you can actually do that. Uh, so this is something that we have. Uh, and so we're kind of like spinning that up now to where when you hit build in Xcode, instead of it building on your machine and taking still a few minutes, we can instead build on 100 Mac minis at the same time and really decrease the overall time, which is a really amazing feature. Um, so you might be asking now, like, OK, so this guy's up here, and the gist of this talk is to tell me to use Bazel. And that might be the right option, depending on what your team situation is, but it might also be a, a terrible idea. So I want to talk about like, some of the trade-offs you get from moving to a tool like this. So one of them that I mentioned earlier as a benefit to us is having control over our build. But this makes a lot of sense for Lyft, where, like I said, we have a few engineers who are working on improving the productivity for everyone else. But this also means that inherently we're taking on like, a lot of a maintenance burden of like now we're in charge of how this whole thing works. Uh, and this trade-off makes a lot of sense for us because we can get a lot of wins for this. But this is like the obvious one where if you don't have the amount of time to invest in it that we do or that some other teams do, this might not be the right option for you. The next thing is that, you know, like Christoph was talking about, like there's a lot of small ways you can improve your developer experience, or some of them are larger ways. But you, know, you can move to project generation. Maybe that is a big problem for your team. Or you can move to pre-compiled dependencies or something. Uh, 
there's a lot of things you can do before you like use this really big hammer of like, okay, I'm going to switch build systems because that ends up taking a huge amount of time and effort. Um, and finally, the thing I want to mention last about this that people always bring up is that you know by switching build systems, you're kind of on your own. I think it depends on how you consider like radar and whether or not you feel like you're really getting support from Apple, I guess, directly on these kind of problems. But this is something you know you have to think about. And I think that the good news, at least in the, in the Bazel community, is that a lot of companies are starting to adopt this kind of tool, especially on the larger scale, because you start hitting these same issues that I've talked about. And so since everything is open source, we can also like, contribute back to the tool, which I think is really great. And I'm, I'm hoping that our contributions like, help lower the bar for other people so that at some point you could practically, transparently switch to this build system and not really have to spend as much time as we have doing that. So, I think that the thing to kind of like take away here is that Bazel is a really great tool that works really well for iOS, but once you need it and once it makes sense for you to use. But if you've decided that it does make sense for you, um, there is a public Bazel Slack and there's an iOS channel in there if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Um, I'm in there, happy to talk about it. Lots of other teams have gone through this same kind of thing and they'd be happy to talk about it too. Um, and that's it, so I hopefully have time for some questions. Thanks. Uh, would you like us to put the images full screen? Oh, uh, we have them ready right now. It's fine, I think they imagined the <laughs> okay. graphs really well, so. <laughs> okay, does anyone have a question? Yeah, we have one here. I think I take it. Hello, hello. Hi. Hi. A uh, simple question. Have you heard about Buck? Sorry? Buck. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting one. So I didn't mention <laughs> it. Uh, the Airbnb folks are out here somewhere. Maybe they can tell us more, uh, more details. Um, yeah, so it took a long time for Buck to support Swift, for one, and that was a big thing that Bazel invested in. I mean, especially, or I don't want to get into the politics of it too much, I guess, but I think Chris Latner going to Google helped a lot because with this whole Swift on TensorFlow thing, I think that's what really pushed Swift inside Google. So Google actually added all of the core like Swift support to Bazel way before Buck did. Um, so that was a big thing. I think the other thing is just that, from, in my opinion, I see like an upward trend with Bazel, not only in mobile, but in just general programming communities. Like actually, plenty of other teams at Lyft actually used Bazel before we were even considering it for some of these other like C++ things. And I don't really feel like I see that community happening around Buck. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, you should, we should talk more uh, you know, later with the Airbnb folks, and maybe they'll disagree. But that was kind of what, how we got there. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? There we are. Hi. Hi. Uh, great talk. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, so one is, when do you think would be like a good time to consider at like maybe the number of developers you have or something to consider switching to? complex tools like this. And another one, did you see a similar increase in performance outside of iOS, so for example, on Android? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, yeah, I'll answer the second one first because that one's easier for us. So our Android team was actually using Buck before Bazel. So the, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Buck is a tool from Facebook that is built by people who used to work on Bazel at Google. So they're like very similar tools. Um, yeah, uh, before it was open source, at least. So uh, they actually used Buck already, so I think that the performance benefits are less so for them because they were already using a tool that kind of gave them a lot of the same stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But actually for us, it's still a little bit TBD because they're still in the process of moving to Bazel on Android. Um, so hopefully we know more about that later. Um, yeah, about the size thing, I mean, I think that that's the really hard question here. I mean, for us, you know, like I said, now we have 70 developers, but we actually started moving to this like more than a year ago. Or actually, we've been on it for over a year, and it took us a few months to do that. So we started probably when we had like 45 or something, because we've grown pretty fast with that. I mean, yeah, I think it's a really hard question. It depends on this like very specific problems you start to face. I, I do worry that you know, you, people could jump into it too quickly. I talked to a lot of people from really small companies who have like less than maybe 10 developers and they're kind of asking like, should I move to this? And 
I, I, yeah, I can't overstate like how much we've had to invest to get it all working. Like I said, I hope that it's better now because we've contributed a lot of that back, but I don't think there's really like a one size fits all answer to that. But I'm happy to talk later about you all specifically if you, if you want, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. One more there. Thank you. Are you hearing me? Uh, Hello? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, how did you adopt it? In, uh, could you adopt it incrementally in the company or how did you achieve this? Because it seems like so radical, the, the change. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you could. I think it depends on how you want that developer experience to work. So we kind of adopted it incrementally where we have uh, something you, you'll hear about later from Michael with this like protobuf code generation pipeline, and we actually adopted Bazel there first for iOS, which kind of gave us a lot of hands-on experience ahead of time, but it didn't affect like, the developer's day-to-day -day at all, because all that did was like, produce static frameworks that we ended up including in our project. So that was kind of incremental. In theory, I have talked to some people who are like, okay, well, we'll add it to some modules first. I think that the difficulty there is just how you want to integrate that into Xcode and how you want it to look for developers. Like, I think it's more of just a UX question of, it's kind of weird if you configure some targets in Xcode and then some targets in this other thing. But I think if you really wanted to do that because you were worried about that, then it's doable. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Thanks. <laughs>